Welcome to the Health Wealth Podcast and Radio Show with Forbes author and contributor Dr. Josh Luke, America's Healthcare Affordability Authority. Visit drjoshluke.com for information on speaking appearances and other resources. Dr. Josh Luke here with the Health Wealth Podcast and Radio Show. It's my honor today to have a longtime friend and a very accomplished uh, hospital CEO and physician, just named as a top hospital CEO. Uh, nationally, uh, once again, actually, it's not the first time he's received that recognition. It's Dr. Tony Sloanum from Renown Health in Reno, Nevada. How you doing, Tony? Great, Josh. Great to be here with you. Thanks for thanks for uh, joining the show. It's truly an honor. Um, if you've read uh, the new book, Health Wealth, uh, is your is healthcare bankrupting your business? Nine Steps to Financial Recovery. Tony's name might sound familiar. He was gracious enough to write the foreword. It was my honor when he accepted to do that. He also, um, some of the uh, ideas he's pioneered are talked about in the book, and so much of what he's pioneered and renowned is talked about in different chapters of the book. It was hard to actually pick which chapter to put him in because they're doing so many neat things. So I want to jump right into it, Dr. Sloanum, because um, you know you guys are doing so many different things, and this podcast is about healthcare affordability. And uh, it is so rare to see a CEO of a traditional hospital organization that now is so much more than than just a hospital like Renown uh, actually committed to making healthcare affordable for their community because traditionally our business model when I was a CEO was about putting heads in beds so if you could kind of combine two answers first give us a little background on you and 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 what type of physician you are and how it led you to a journey to a CEO and then your personal journey and how you combine that with being a hospital CEO and making healthcare affordable for northern nevada Sure, Josh. Thank you again for the invitation to be here. I think that for you know my own personal journey, I was a physician. All I ever wanted to do was be a doctor, um, and really thought about becoming a you know the guy and guy who was uh, taking care of families. I grew up in a small town and wanted to take care of entire families, their children, and I think that framed a large part of my uh, my professional interest. Unfortunately, the residency I went to didn't train a primary care doctor. They trained an intensive care doctor. Out of my four-year residency, I spent probably 18 months in the intensive care unit, so felt much more comfortable in the ICU than I did actually in the office. Um, And that led to me doing clinical care fellowships, and I practiced for a very long time as an ICU specialist for kids, kids with cancer, kids with heart disease, kids with trauma, And along that journey, I got some amazing mentorship and career advice. But you can't do that for your whole career. You you know, when you're watching kids die, 300, 400 kids a year die, no matter how strong they are, that gets to you. And so I had some really good mentorship. And my mentor said to me, hey, what are you going to do when you're done taking care of sick kids and families? Because you're going to burn out. And that's just part and parcel of what that career does to young physicians. And they said, we don't care if you become a researcher, a teacher, an educator, whatever you want to do, an administrator, figure out what you want to do now and get the training for. And so I experimented in all those areas, research, still do it, teaching, eh, do it, but not as much, and administration, do it a lot now, and got those skill sets along the way and, and have applied them to my work each day. And I think that's really where where my work at Renown Health comes in because I've got not only my MD but a doctorate in public health and like to say that the challenges that are facing health systems today are more public health or you know uh, are more affected by public health than anything else when we look at the issues about trauma and drinking and prematurity and obesity and smoking these are public health problems that affect the communities we serve. And so having a background in public health has really helped us as we think about how we serve the needs of our community, but how others can think about it as well. That's great, that's great. So in Health Wealth, is healthcare bankrupting your business, nine steps to financial recovery? There's there's two concepts in particular that Renown Health has done a fantastic job of under your leadership. And and one of them is just uh, being a part of the community. And I, I always say, hey, um, you know, uh, 
my question, you know, as I sat down to wrote health, write Health Wealth, I said, you know, I, I wonder how much of the healthcare dollar in Northern Nevada is leaving Northern Nevada. So number one, there's always a um, unemployment issue in, in the community, at least a couple percentage points mm -hmm. at the minimum, right? So if you looked at every dollar the big companies are spending in Northern Nevada on healthcare, and I know Amazon's got some presence up there, Starbucks, lots of other companies that have big presence up there, the casinos, the, the, the properties as well. So if you looked at the dollars they're spending on healthcare, what percentage of it is leaving Northern Nevada? My question would be, get that amount and say, can we start this over? And that's just an example of are you being in touch with your community and saying, why would any dollars leave our community if, if all the care can be provided here? The other thing you guys do well is the DNA testing, but let's start with the question of just community and being in touch with your community. How do you do that as the leader of an organization who has literally become so influential in the community that, um, that you, you, the community just knows that you're there to listen? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And Anytime you're talking about affordability, it brings you back to the value proposition in healthcare. How are you driving the two elements of the value proposition? We want quality to get better, and we want costs to go down. Unfortunately, in Nevada, we've had the value proposition upside down. We have ranked traditionally in the bottom five states in the country from a quality perspective, and in the top five states in the country from a cost perspective. And so we've taken this opportunity to take a blank piece of paper and say if we could design the system differently to drive to affordability what would that look like and the good news for us is that we cover our broad geographic area we cover 80,000 square miles between sacramento and salt lake city and we are the only tertiary provider and as you think about that we like to define or describe our work across that broad geographic region as a fabric or a lattice upon which we will hang assets that help to drive into the health needs of that specific community. And if you're serving the needs of the community, not only from a health care perspective when people are sick or injured, but from a health perspective, we believe that that will pay dividends in the long run, improve quality, decrease costs, and lead to more affordability because the insurers, if people are lucky enough to be insured, will have to pay less over time with people living healthier lives. That's our model, and, and we're sticking to it. Now, it takes time, effort, energy, and commitment to be able to do those things, particularly in a broad geographic region, because you don't see the turnaround as quickly as all of us would like. Most of us are impatient, but we believe that by putting our energy in the right place, we will, over time, be able to succeed at this approach. Yeah, you know, I remember, it's been 20 years, Tony, but I, I remember seeing a stat in the mid-90s that Nevada was the second largest state by geography, but the second least populous at the time. Now, of course, you've seen massive growth in northern and southern Nevada, so it's not the second least populous anymore. I just remember being shocked that even in the early 90s, Nevada was one of the least populous states, but it's because it, it's such a huge state, but there were really only two or three major cities when you think of Reno, Carson City, and southern Nevada. You've seen growth there, and that comment about Sacramento to Salt Lake, I don't think people realize um, how huge that area is. And I actually had the opportunity to speak uh, a few weeks ago. Tony and I were able to get together and grab coffee, but I was able to speak to the Nevada Hospital Association, both in southern and northern, and, and northern Nevada, and it was just a reminder. I've spoken for our state hospital associations all over the country. I remember in particular the meeting in northern Nevada. Uh, of all the people represented, they had so little in common. They were from all over the place. And it was really difficult to stay focused on one topic when you have rural hospitals. You have tertiary one tertiary hospital. You have, it, it, it just really showed the uniqueness. Even trying to hold the room, which is usually one of my strengths, was really difficult to do because it was so diverse. So that leads me to my next um, topic, which is one of my favorite stories. We tell it in the book. I promote it on social media every time I see an update on it, which is your vision to partner with the Desert Research Institute and 23andMe to really bring personalized medicine to Northern Nevada. So can you tell us where that idea originated and how it's uh, kind of um, evolved? Well, you know, Josh, early in my career, I had the great experience of being a health services researcher. When I was going through that discovery phase as a young physician with that mentorship, I spent some time learning how to do research and my mentors uh, actually, who contributed quite a bit. We all know, you know, we can think back to those people in our lives who influenced us the most. Sure. My 
papers, you know, suggested that you couldn't do really good health or health care without understanding data and applied analytics. How do you understand what your community needs and really go about driving programming that serves those needs? And so, you know, we've known for a while how much the social determinants of health impact the ability to live healthy and, to some extent, our health care. And so if you include social determinants and environments and genetics and the clinical care we deliver to people, wow, we might actually be able to unlock the secret for how to strategically invest in our community and make them healthier. Well, it just turns out that Desert Research Institute is a worldwide enterprise located right here in northern Nevada as a public entity and, you know, funded by the State Higher Education Division and the Governor's Office of Economic Development. And their Applied Innovation Center of data scientists, brilliant people, who can take large masses of data and find themes and trends in them that you and I would never be able to uncover. Well, we found these guys, we partnered with them, we did all the right stuff behind the scenes in terms of business associate agreements and HIPAA and confidentiality, and we gave them 10 years of data. And then they combined and contributed to the cause of the environmental data, and the governor and the state gave us the social data. And we started looking for patterns of disease with the idea that we could really invest in those analytics. And for me, it would be the best strategic planning program for the health of Northern Nevada. The idea being, if you could anticipate where the, the occurrence or the incidence of disease was increasing, wow, those are programs I need to put in place from a healthcare perspective 10 years from now. So for me, it was the ultimate in strategic planning and B, it, we all know how important it is to con engage consumers to modify their behavior and improve their health today. So what was the hook? What was the way we could tell consumers, hey, you're at risk for cardiovascular disease and you need to lose weight, exercise more, and eat healthier? And the 23andMe platform allowed us to do that. In 48 hours, we enrolled 10,000 people. And now we have their genetic data in that data warehouse, finding trends, understanding patterns of disease and illness so that we can have a healthier Nevada. It's called the Healthy Nevada Project. And we have just now signed on with another vendor called Helix to enroll the next 40,000 people. Tell, Very me what, tell, tell me what Helix brings to the table that uh, wasn't already part of the project. That's interesting. Yep. So Helix... We've now evolved past the point of just giving people information back. Helix has a platform that's available on people's phone and their app store and allows them, based on a specific risk, to sign up with an app that reduces that risk. So if you have high cholesterol, we're giving participants in the Helix project the access to that free app to help them lower their cholesterol. If it's about losing weight, it's about how do we help them lose weight. So it's about action promoting in terms of better health lives and, and what we do in that regard. I think the most important thing, though, that we look at consumer engagement in the genetics project is meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. On a continuum from not really engaged to fully engaged, we have a spectrum of people in our community. And on the one hand, there are people like, I just want my ancestry. I want to know where my family came from and were they really Italian. And on the other hand, there are those who want to know everything about, you know, their risk for all kinds of cancers, the risk for cardiovascular disease, the risk of transmitting heritable diseases to their children. Our job is not to be paternalistic. It's to offer people a suite of projects that, and products that engage them where they are on that continuum. If they are interested only in their ancestry, that's what we give them. If they're interested in the, the high-end genetic counseling, that's what we give them. And we think that by that approach and engaging people where they are, we're helping to drive a better dialogue around health literacy, which we all know in this country is really problematic. So you're, uh, what, 12 to 24 months into the project now? Only 18, about 18 in March. Okay, 18 months. So I remember talking to Dr. Feinberg about their simple, about their similar MyCode initiative, and I know you've read up and, and you and Dr. Feinberg have discussed it as well. 
his comment was, I learned things I wasn't expecting. He was caught off guard, I guess was the right. best way. So what he learned was not what he was looking to learn. Um, so have you had the same experience? And what have been some of those key learnings that kind of surprised you or caught you off guard? Yeah, you know, it's one of those things. We are learning things more than ever. And I think the most fascinating learning, out of the 10,000 people who enrolled uh, in the Healthy Nevada Project, one-third of them are from our five most disadvantaged zip codes. Okay. And so it goes to highlight that people are hungry for information about their health and their well-being. And they all have a device on their hip called a cell phone that we can engage them in, even if they're impoverished. And by the way, what better way to engage a community than the people who are most at risk in many circumstances? Um, obviously, I think the 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 piece of DNA testing, as you, and you kind of mentioned lineology and, and how people, genealogy, are so excited to hear about that. But the real piece of real medicine, personalized medicine that's, that's arrived is pharmacogenetics. But I know in my experience in talking to some physicians, they weren't ready to implement it because if your EMR could adapt, but the nursing homes couldn't, and then the hospital across towns couldn't, they were worried that what they were going to prescribe was going to end up being uh, unprescribed, and then everybody would be at risk, which of course, as a former hospital CEO, I know we all do uh, stay away from the risk stuff. So tell me your thoughts on is pharmacogenetics, uh, are we ready for it? Is it happening? And where do you see it benefiting? Yeah, I, I think there is, uh, there's certainly great potential with pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenetics in healthcare. I know that in Northern Nevada, we're not ready for the conversation. We're for, the, for the reasons I discussed or different yeah. reasons? Well, I think there's some there uh, I, I might add. I'm not sure. I think there's that continuum conversation where all people are not ready to participate fully. I think there's also the challenge of we haven't yet figured out the right way, although we're doing lots of talking with uh, appropriate people, learning from our colleagues like David at Geisinger and learning from, from the folks at Epic about how we in integrate this important information into the electronic medical record so it's actionable. There are also some risks, um, and while there are regulatory protections about disenfranchising people who, you know, from an insurance perspective via the GINA Act, you know, that protects them from being disenfranchised or paying higher premiums or being carved out with pre-existing conditions because of their genetic predisposition. We're all a little bit skeptical about where we are currently in the United States and, and what that looks like from a regulatory. Well, things come down the line that change those predispositions and make people more vulnerable before. So we're taking a relatively conservative approach to how we engage with this work um, and make sure that our community is ready to hear it and that they are protected as leaders on this front. So for, for you listeners, here's the most important thing that you can take from this last discussion between Dr. Slonim and I. You have the power to own this. You can do your DNA test, your full genome, your partial genome sequence. You can get a printout. You can take a picture. You can, every time you're in the hospital or at the physician's office, show the doctor and say, no, that doesn't work for me. Here's what works for me. But, but the system itself isn't quite ready. And that's what really health wealth is all about, is each individual becoming an EHC, an engaged healthcare consumer. And one of the quickest way to do it, ways to do it is get your genome sequence, own it, carry it with you, take pictures of it on your phone so you can control your own health care because that's what our goal is 10 or 15 years from now to be to a place where everybody's an EHC which creates competition which brings prices down improves personalized medicine and really gets you focused on preventative medicine so I want to kind of wrap up the last couple questions with this Dr. Sloan can can you give me some examples of renowned health this trend we see nationally uh, where renowned health is actually going straight to the employer and kind of skipping the insurer, if you will. Even this morning, the lead story in modern healthcare was about the growth of that. So can you give me some examples of where you're doing that, or at least in the conversations to do that? Sure, absolutely. So we have had, uh, we're a little bit different. And the thing that, uh, one of the things that attracted me to renowned health was the fact that we're vertically integrated. We have all elements of the healthcare continuum. So we've got acute care hospitals and and Josh, you know from work that we're doing together for American College of Healthcare Executives about the work we're doing in the transitional care area. We've got a large medical group with providers in the community who provide both, perform both primary care and specialty care. And most importantly, we have a health insurance company. 
Now, while many organizations have started insurance programs over the last five years, ours is very mature. We actually insure about one-third of the entire community. And what's important about that, we just didn't come to the business. The business has existed long before I ever got here. We're celebrating our 30th year as an insurer in the community. And with that goes some special and important work. We're as invested as the next guy because we're the insurer. We want to see affordability improve. We want to make sure that our doctors are driving the value proposition. Why? Because it matters to one important aspect. One of our four operating divisions is that insurance company. So the overall impact on Renown Health is, is balanced because of that insurance product that we provide. And we've seen a five-term growth in our small and medium-sized employer partners engaging with us over the course of the last three to four years by virtue of the, some of the work that we're doing. And the more that we engage people, to your point, as health consumers, and they ask us questions, they make us better. Ask, challenge us. We want to be as good as we can be. And that will only come through a shared commitment by all of us getting better and asking the right questions. And I think the points Dr. Slonim is, is underscoring there, you know, at health-wealth.com, we talk a lot about you as the listener becoming an EHC, an engaged healthcare consumer, just as you would when you're buying a car or a home. Uh, you've also heard me talk about the three P's to becoming an EHC, which is have a plan based on preventative and personalized medicine. When you can master those things, you are going to bring your healthcare costs down. You're going to improve your access to quality providers, and you're going to help bring healthcare costs in America down because you're going to create competition amongst the providers who traditionally haven't had a lot of competition. You heard Dr. Sloan mention that he and I will be presenting together at the American College of Healthcare Executives World Congress in Chicago in March. We would love to see you out there. Uh, there's so much more to Dr. Sloan and Renowned Health. There's no way we could have covered it here in just this short amount of time. What many of you don't know is that I actually I uh, lived in Northern Nevada for several years, have been a patient at Renown, uh, have been able to witness the, uh, the great work they've done both before and after Dr. Slonim got there. You won't find a hospital that's had to deal with more um, incidents that you've heard of, uh, you know, tragic events, whether it's the air races or, or other things going on in Northern Nevada, an, an unfortunate shooting on their campus at one point in time. This hospital has four or five case studies where they really just came together as a great team and handled an incident that nobody could have prepared for. Can you just share one of those briefly with us, one that kind of makes you the proudest? Because I know you've had a handful of them, Dr. Slonim. Yeah, you know, Josh, every day our people come to work to do a great job. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because the work that our employees do, every patient, every family at a time, is probably the thing that makes me the most proud. Across the nation, um, we have seen tragedy. Um, having an on-campus shooting is a humbling experience. I wasn't here at the time, but I can only imagine. And we've learned from those events, and we've learned as a community. The air races, when something impacts the community to that degree, you know, it's not just renown. It's our sister institutions in town who all stepped up, and the community comes together. But when something like that happens, the first thing we can do is say, hey, how was the Cystic Trauma Center? Can we send you surgeons? Can we send you blood? Can we send you whatever expertise we have on the ground? How can we be of assistance um, to keep the day-to-day -day going? And one of the things I love about healthcare is how we come together during moments of tragedy. But let's remember that any given day might be a tragedy for an individual or a family because of a heart attack, because of an injury they didn't expect, because of something that went on that they didn't uh, expect when they woke up in the morning. And our providers are there every day helping them to do that work. And of that, I'm very proud. Yeah, as, as you should be. It's a phenomenal organization, the growth of Renown Health, uh, what used to be known as uh, Washoe Medical Center and, then, and a number of other products rebranded as Renown. Um, two stories I kind of want to close with. Dr. Sloan might not even know the know, know that this the history of this, um, which is I actually even though I don't know if my camera dropped here or what it might be, but you can't see me anymore. So let me lift it up. Um, I actually was on campus the day of the shooting. It was the first time I'd been on campus in about ten years. I was there to uh, help with an assessment on something, and 
I, I sat there as, as the code gray was called and and I can personally attest that your team even before they were team even before they were your team was phenomenal they rallied um, and they, they did a wonderful job of, of doing what they've been trained to do but I want to tell you about the when dr. Sloanham and I actually first met um, we, we were speaking at an event and uh, dr. Sloanham and I got to talking and um, I said, you know, I, I wrote a report for you guys, and it actually was uh, as a result of the day I was up there that I just talked about. And uh, he says, you know, I actually just read that report, and, and, and that's where I recognized your name because I thought to myself, gosh, I should have read this my first week here instead of nine months later because I compared it to my notes, and so much of it was right on and very similar. And, and that really started our relationship where, you know, what, what he learned in his first nine months is kind of what I learned when I did the research that, that this health system was doing a great job but there was so much opportunity to do even better. So Dr. Sloanham, I want to close with um, a question I ask all my guests, your favorite sports team, whether college or pro, just to kind of uh, end on up note. It, it's actually funny being here in Northern Nevada. I'm still a New York Giants fan and <laughs> will be uh, will be up until the day I die. So we'll, we'll keep that uh, kind of on the down low. <laughs> yeah, maybe next year. It can't get any worse than this year for that. So, <laughs> so next year's the year, right? So, so Dr. Tony Sloanham, CEO of Renown Health, uh, really a, a visionary pioneer for health, wealth, and, and pioneering uh, health care in this community. Thank you for joining, joining me, Dr. Slonim. I'll see you in, in Chicago in March, if not sooner. Uh, and to all the listeners on the Health, Wealth podcast and radio show, uh, check out Dr. Slonim on LinkedIn or on Twitter also. What's your Twitter handle, Dr. Slonim? MDCEO Renown. All right. There you go. So thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the Health, Wealth podcast and radio show with Dr. Josh Luke. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Health Wealth Podcast and Radio Show with Forbes author and contributor Dr. Josh Luke, America's Healthcare Affordability Authority. Visit drjoshluke.com for information on speaking appearances and other resources.